And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon His pure and beloved Messenger, the peak of His creation, our beloved, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. And his immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited Savior, Al Imam Al Mahdi Ajjallahu Ta'ala Farajah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. وَرَسُولًا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ أَنِّي قَدْ جِئْتُكُمْ بِآيَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ أَنِّي أَخْلُقُ لَكُمْ مِنَ الطِّينِ كَهَيْئَةِ الطَّيْرِ فَأَنْفُخُ فِيهِ فَيَكُونُ طَيْرًا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ صدق الله العلي العظيم Without the slightest doubt, the religion of Islam is the religion of moderation. And those deviants within the religion of Islam usually fall on two extremes. Either you find them too liberal, not adhering to the true teachings of the faith of Islam, or you find them too radical, too fundamental, too extreme, too conservative. Now, one of the most important topics in the religion of Islam, which has fallen on the two extremes throughout history, is the position of the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. You find that there are two devious paths over here regarding the position of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. The first path are those who belittle the value of the Imams. They diminish from their greatness. They tell you these people were simply normal people. Yes, they could have been pious. They could have been believing people who contributed, but they were not appointed by God. They did not have the position of leadership given to them by the Almighty God. A second group of people who fall on the other side of the extreme are those who gave supernatural powers to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt to the extent that they gave them divine powers. In fact, some of them even went so far to declare them as gods and worship them as gods. Now, this second group of people in the Ahadith literature that we have and in the Arabic language are referred to as the Ghulat, those people who practiced Ghulu. Those people who were idolizers. What is the definition of ghulu in the Arabic language? In the Arabic language, the word ghulu linguistically means when anything exceeds its limits, it is ghulu. Why were these people referred to as ghulat, idolizers? Because they exceeded their limits. They raised the status of the imams to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, they exceeded their limits and they were referred to as idolizers. They idolized the Imams of Ahlul Bayt by exceeding their limits. It is very important to analyze the history of this group and how this impacts us today. Let us begin by examining the history, a brief history of the idolizers, the Ghulat, and let us try to see what is it that constitutes ghulu? What is it that constitutes idolization? And how does that apply to our lives? When we examine the history of idolization, we find that it is as old as the religion of Islam itself. It dates back to the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. One narration tells us one day, a man approached the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and he told him, As-salamu alayka ya Rabbi. Peace be upon you, O my Lord. The Prophet, peace be upon him, became furious with the statement. The Prophet said, How dare you, may God curse you. You consider me your Lord? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is my Lord and your Lord. So this issue of idolization, of ascribing divine attributes to human beings and elevating them to the status of being God is as old as the religion of Islam. 
However, when we come to the time of the commander of the faithful, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, we see that this issue of idolization becomes more and more important in that society and it becomes more and more of a problem. During the time of the first Imam, peace be upon him, a group of idolizers emerged who started to worship Ali ibn Abi Talib Now one of those early idolizers was a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Sabah. This man whom by the way you probably have heard of because there are ignorant Muslims throughout history who have made this claim that Abdullah ibn Sabah is the one who started Shiism. He is the father of today's Shiism. And we see Ibn Taymiyyah as one of those people who propagated this idea. But I tell you, this man had nothing to do with Shiism. In fact, he was an enemy to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. This man claimed that Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, was God. We have, for example, al allam al-Hilli, he writes about this man. He says, Abdullah ibn Sabah is a cursed idolizer. He was a hypocrite. He claimed that he was a prophet and Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, was God. And as a result of his claims, of his blasphemy, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, actually punished him by executing him in the way of sending him to fire. The Imam Ali salam, burned him because of these false claims. As Shaykh Al-Tusi also confirms this fact. He says, Abdullah ibn Sabah initially, he declared that he is Muslim, but then he reverted back to disbelief. Another scholar by the name of Al-Kishi. Al-Kishi was a specialist in the science of men. You know, he was one of those early scholars who would evaluate the companions of the Prophet. Are they reliable? Are they not reliable? Al-Kishi says, all the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they denounced Abdullah ibn Sabah. They considered him a heretic. And in fact, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, when he realized that Abdullah ibn Sabah was claiming that he was a prophet and Ali ibn Abi Talib is God, the Imam Ali salam, gave him three days to do tawbah, to repent from this heresy, from this disbelief. But Abdullah ibn Sabah kept on insisting he says, no, I will not do tawbah. You're my Lord and I'm your prophet. I will not compromise. After three days, the Imam Ali salam, gave him three days to repent. He refused the offer. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib Ali salam, executed him by burning him because of this blasphemy that he was spreading in that society. We have Abu Hamza Thamani, this great companion of Imam Zayn al-Abideen salawatullahi alayhi. <laughs> Abu Hamza Thamani says, once I was in the presence of the fourth Imam of Ahl al-Bayt, Imam Ali ibn al-Hussein alayhi salam, he spoke about Abdullah ibn Sabah. And he said, may God curse those ones who forged narrations against us, the Ahl al-Bayt, and they concocted lies against us. May God curse them. Just now I remembered Abdullah ibn Sabah. The fourth Imam is saying this. Just now I remembered Abdullah ibn Sabah and the huge claims that he did about Ali ibn Abi Talib. And I felt the goosebumps in all of my body parts. How dare he say something like that? May God curse him. Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, was only a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He achieved piety through obedience. He obeyed Allah and his prophet. The Imams of Ahl al-Bayt categorically would denounce this group. And in fact, the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt would prohibit their followers from mingling with them. They would advise their companions to dissociate from them. Don't go near these people because these people are poisonous in society and they will destroy themselves and bring the wrath of God and the government, not only on themselves, but on you, O companions. Now the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, interestingly, he warned this ummah about this phenomenon of idolizing the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. And he even foretold Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam about this group of idolizers. In a beautiful hadith, 
The Prophet tells Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, he tells him, Oh Ali, the likeness of you in my nation, in my ummah, is like the likeness of Jesus, son of Mary. When we examine Jesus, son of Mary, we see that his group divided, his followers divided into three groups. The first group were his true followers, who are known by what in the Holy Quran? As the Hawariyin, his true disciples who followed him. They are saved. And then the Prophet says there was a second group who had enmity towards Jesus, son of Mary, and they fought him, they tried to kill him, and those were the Jews. And then the Prophet says, you had a third group of people who idolized Jesus, son of Mary. They worshipped him and they considered him to be God or part of God. These people lost their belief by doing so. Just as the followers of Jesus, the son of Mary, divided into three groups. Oh Ali, this ummah shall also divide into three groups when it comes to your position in my ummah. You will have three groups. The first one are your true followers, the Shia. They will obey you and follow you. They are the ones who are saved. And then, O oh Ali, you have your enemies who shall attack you. Your enemies are those who are doubtful. They have no faith in their heart. And then there will be a third group, O oh Ali ibn Abi Talib. This group will worship you and idolize you. They will be of the ghulat. These people are the hypocrite ones. These people are those who have no belief in their hearts. And let me tell you, Ali ibn Abi Talib, only you, your Shia, and the lovers of, Shia, of your Shia will go to paradise. As for the other two groups, those who worship you and those who fight you shall end up in hellfire. And subhanAllah, he himself, Ali ibn Abi Talib, السلام, in a beautiful hadith, he says, rajulan. Two people, because of me, through me, shall be perished. Two people because of me shall go astray and go to hell. One of them, muhibbun ghal, and the other one, aduun qal. One of them is an enemy who displays his hatred towards me. This person shall perish. And the other one who thinks he loves me or he claims to love me, but this man is a disbeliever because he worships me. These two people shall perish because of me. Now this phenomenon of idolization did not stop during the time of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib We see that it carried on throughout the period of the entire Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Every once in a while you had a group of people, mischievous people, who would idolize the Imams and claim to worship the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. Now you will find interestingly that the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt, the Umayyad dynasty, and the Abbasid dynasty, they indirectly supported these idolizers. You would think, why? As an enemy of Ahlul Bayt, you don't want to see anyone worshipping the Imams, claiming to love the Imams to the point where they're actually declaring them gods or giving them divine attributes. Why would you think the enemies of Ahlul Bayt, the Abbasid government, and the Umayyad dynasty, why would they indirectly support these people? Because their goal was to discredit the Ahlul Bayt. And by supporting these groups, they did manage to somehow discredit the Ahlul Bayt. Because when you have people who are idolizing the Imams and worshipping them, that gets the Imams in trouble. Because now, the evil government has the justification to fight the Imams. They will tell their people and, commu and their communities that these Imams are inviting people to worship them. And this is why we are fighting them. The Imams of Ahlul Bayt therefore found every opportunity to denounce these people so that their enemies, the evil governments of the time, they do not have the justification to fight the Imams in the pretext of fighting these idolizers. And they prohibited their companions from associating with these idolizers. Now one of the qualities of the idolizers, one of the things that they would constantly do they would forge fake narrations and attribute them to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt to justify their position. They would make up hadiths, forge hadiths, in order to justify their beliefs that the Imam had godly powers or that the Imams were somehow gods. And Imam al-Rada, 
اللهم صل على محمد In one narration, he says, Inna Abel Khattab. Abel Khattab was a man who was one of the leaders of the idolizers. And he used to spread their beliefs. He says, this evil man, Abu Khattab, he managed to forge hadiths and he attributed these narrations to my grandfather, Al-Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq. May God curse Abu Khattab and his companions for doing that. And the Imam would alert their companions to these falsified narrations. So now if we have narrations from the companions of the Imams, which are forged, which speak so highly of the Imams and elevate their position, how can we decipher which of these narrations are correct, are authentic, and which are not? Imam Rada in this narration, he gives us the criteria. He tells his companions, oh my companions, whenever you hear such narrations, I instruct you to analyze these narrations in accordance with the Holy Quran. Put these narrations side by side next to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's see what the book of Allah says. If you can find, if you can confirm these narrations through the Holy Quran, then you can accept them. But if you see that these narrations contradict the Holy Quran, then you cannot accept these narrations. So take these narrations, see if they are compatible with the Holy Quran, with the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and with our earlier narrations which have been confirmed to you. See if it makes sense based on this criteria, then accept it. Otherwise, reject these ahadith. Therefore, in order for us, brothers and sisters, to understand and grasp what idolization is, and what is it that constitutes idolization? We have to refer to the Holy Quran. What does the Quran say about ghulu? About the act of idolizing? When we examine the Holy Quran, we see the Holy Quran in a number of instances speaks about this belief of idolization. The Holy Quran specifically refers to the people of the book. Ya ahl al-kitab la taghlu fi deenikum. In one verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, O oh, people of the book, do not exceed your limits. Do not be amongst the idolizers. How did they exceed their limits according to the Holy Quran? Say only the truth. Do not ascribe any false claims to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّمَا الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ مَرْيَمْ إِنَّمَا الْمَسِيحُ عِيسَ بْنُ مَرْيَمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Jesus, the son of Mary, the Messiah, is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's not God. He's not divine. Avoid the Trinity. Do not believe that he is a part of God because this is an act of idolization. Now, the Holy Quran does not condemn this act of idolization because the people of the book believe that Prophet Jesus السلام, had supernatural powers. That's not why. Yes, for example, you see in their teachings in the Bible, Prophet Isa السلام, had supernatural powers. He used to cure the leper, he used to cure the blind, he used to revive the dead, he used to walk on water, he used to create birds from clay. That's all fine. The Quran does not have a problem with that. In fact, as we shall see, the Quran shall confirm that. The reason why the Holy Quran denounces their beliefs is because they extended divine qualities to Prophet Isa السلام. And this was an act of idolization which the Holy Quran denounces. But then the Holy Quran introduces us to a second type of idolization. So worshipping Jesus, peace be upon him, or claiming that he is a part of God, he is divine, that's one type of idolization. There is another interesting type of idolization that the Holy Quran focuses our attention to. In, in describing the second type of idolization, the Holy Quran speaks about those devious scholars or religious leaders who follow their desires and the people follow them, knowing that they follow their desires. The Holy Quran considers this also a type of idolization. When you follow a religious figure, and that figure, that religious figure, follows his desires, plays with religion as he sees fit, then you're also participate, participating in this act of idolization. The Holy Quran says, ahbarahum min 
They took their religious leaders, their rabbis and monks, as gods besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One day, one of the people of the book, he approached the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. He told him, oh Muhammad, I have a question. Your Quran says that the people of the book worshipped their scholars, the monks and the rabbis. I don't understand. We don't worship them. How do you claim that we worship them? The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, asked him, oh man, let me ask you a question. Have you seen them legalize and declare permissible something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited? Have you seen them prohibit something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made legal? He says, yes. Throughout history, they've definitely done some of that. The Prophet, peace be upon him, says, this is how you worship them. Because now you're no longer worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're worshiping these human beings who are tampering with religion and you're following their man-made religion, not the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a warning to all Muslims throughout history, respected brothers and sisters. The Holy Quran is very clear that anyone who legalizes something which God has prohibited or prohibits something which God has legalizes is an idolizer and this person's faith is under question. And subhanAllah, when you look at the history of the companions of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, as Ahmed ibn Hanbal tells us in his book, Al-Musnad, you all know that famous companion who when he came to power, what did he say? He says there were two mut'ahs during the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. They were permissible, but I declare them as haram. I declare them as impermissible and I will punish anyone that I see practicing these two. SubhanAllah. You examine the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you apply this verse. In essence, the Holy Quran is demonstrating to us that when you follow those which have not been appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they legalize something which is haram or they declare haram something which is halal, you are idolizing these people. And according to the Holy Quran, these people are ghulat. This is a form of ghulu, a form of exceeding the limit. Because the definition of ghulu, anything which exceeds the Holy Quran, goes beyond it, or the sunnah of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, is an act of ghulu. Now that we have understood the position of the Holy Quran with respect to idolization, let us ask ourselves, what constitutes idolization? What kind of beliefs, if a person, you know, harbors in their hearts and their mind, the Holy Quran would consider them to be idolizers? Obviously, this is an area which is highly debated and contested amongst the scholars of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. You will not have one unified position. However, there are five beliefs that the majority of our scholars have generally accepted that they constitute idolization. So for the first one, obviously, is to believe that the Imam of Ahlul Bayt, any of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt are gods. This is a conspicuous, flagrant form of idolization. A second type of idolization, which is unanimously rejected by our, all scholars, is to believe that any of the Imams was a prophet of God. The seal of the messengers is the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. No prophet came after him. So to believe that they were prophets is also an act of idolization. A third belief which constitutes as idolization is the belief that the imams of Ahlul Bayt had the knowledge of the unseen independently from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or even the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. That's why one verse in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the Prophet, tell them that I do not know the knowledge of the unseen. In other words, the Prophet, peace be upon him, was demonstrating to his community, don't think that I'm divine, that I'm some sort of God. I have nothing from myself. Anything that I have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To believe that any prophet or human being has the knowledge of the unseen, ilm al ghaib independently from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is an act of idolization. Another act of idolization, which unfortunately throughout history, there have been many... Muslims who consider, themselves, who consider themselves to be Muslims, they've practiced. And that is to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has either united with the imams of Ahlul Bayt or he has settled in their bodies. Until this very day, you will find small groups 
of so-called Muslims who do actually embrace this belief. They believe that Allah, they believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala settled in the body of Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is also an act of kuf kufr and, the, and an act of idolization. Now the fifth one, which is somewhat disputed amongst our scholars, is the belief that the Imams, peace be upon them, had certain divine powers like creating the universe and sustaining all of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. According to the majority of scholars, this belief also constitutes an act of idolization. Now, the difference between this fifth one and the four previous ones is that our scholars have agreed that anyone who believes in the first four cannot be a Muslim. This will cause them to leave the religion of Islam. If you believe, you know, that the Imams were gods or they were prophets or God settled in them or they independently had the knowledge of the unseen. But as for the fifth item, which is to believe that they created the universe or that they sustain the people, they give the rizq to the people. This is contested and disputed amongst the scholars. Does this cause a person to lose his Islamic status, to no longer be considered a Muslim? Or is this simply an act of deviation? And most of the ulama, they consider this fifth item to be an act of deviation. So this person is still considered Muslim, However, this person is a devious Muslim, a person who does not have the truth. Now, once we have examined what is it that constitutes idolization, a very important subject with respect to the positions, for, with the position of the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them, is that to believe they had supernatural powers, they performed miracles, does this constitute idolization? Is this a type of ghulu? To answer this question, Al-Imam al gave us the criteria. He says, go back to the Holy Quran. See if you can confirm it in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then accept it. Otherwise, you have to reject it. Well, what does the Holy Quran say about this? You know, the act, the belief that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt had supernatural powers. The Holy Quran when it speaks about Prophet Isa السلام, and the miracles that he performs, the Holy, the Holy Quran is very clear that he was able to demonstrate supernatural powers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Holy Quran that Prophet Isa السلام, had the power to create. I can create for you a type of bird from clay and I will blow in it from my spirit, and then it will become a living bird that will fly. And the people, the Bani Israel, they saw these miracles. However, this was all done بِإِذْنِلَّهِ with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, to believe that a prophet of God or an imam can demonstrate and perform such supernatural powers with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, number one, with the intention of guiding people, number two, is completely acceptable from the Qur'anic perspective. And this is not an act of idolization. The Holy Qur'an tells us that Prophet Isa السلام, could cure the one who was born blind. He was able to walk on water according to our narrations, and he was even able to revive the dead. None of this constitutes idolization because the Holy Qur'an confirms it. It is by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Imam Al-Husayn alayhi salam Allahumma salli ala According to one narration, he says, one day I was sitting next to my father, Amir Al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him, when two groups of people walked in. The first group were amongst those who loved my father, the followers of my father. And the second group were those who were against my father, the enemies of my father. When the Imam السلام, was in their presence and these two groups sat next to my father, Amir al muminin Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, told them, Today I want to perform a miracle to finish and establish the hujjah of God, the proof of God on you. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran that He revealed and He descended that heavenly meal 
to the disciples of Prophet Jesus to demonstrate as proof that he was chosen by God and that anyone who would reject after that, the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be severe. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, said, I will do the same thing today. And if you reject after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will no longer excuse you. And Imam al Hussein salam, narrates this incident. He says, I saw my father, next to my father, there was a dead tree, a pomegranate tree. It, was, it had dried up, it was dead. My father, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, revived this tree. He gave life to this tree. With the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it became green. And the most beautiful pomegranates emerged and were generated from this tree. He says, then I saw an interesting scene. As for the followers of my father, the branches of this tree overextended above their heads and the fruits were lowered, the pomegranates, they took those fruits and they consumed them and they thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for the enemies of my father, immediately when they, thought, when they saw that scene, they did not believe that my father Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, was an imam chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to punish them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not allow them to eat from that tree. They extended their arms to pick those fruits, but the tree kept going further and further away from them. And then Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, said, this is exactly what will happen on the day of judgment. As for my followers, heaven, paradise will come towards them and will appear near them. As for my enemies, they will try to go towards paradise. And just as this, this tree, you know, was running away from you, paradise will also run away from you. Oh, my enemies. Therefore, when we hear such incidents, respected brothers and sisters, such narrations about the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, we should not immediately reject them. If we have received these narrations from a reliable source, the Holy Quran confirms that the vicegerents of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the representatives of God on earth, do have such powers. And if anyone disputes with you and considers this an act of disbelief or idolization, simply refer them to Prophet Isa alayhi salam and him being able to demonstrate those wonderful miracles. Secondly, with respect to Ilm al ghayb the Imams of Ahlul Bayt definitely had the knowledge of the unseen. And that was to the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does the Holy Quran say about the knowledge of the unseen? First of all, in the story of Prophet Isa alayhi salam, the Holy Quran confirms that Prophet Isa had some sort of the knowledge of the unseen. In one verse, Prophet Isa alayhi salam told his people, O oh people, I can tell you when you had dinner last night in your homes, what you had for lunch or dinner, what did you eat? And I can tell you what you have stored in your homes. Now, isn't this a knowledge of the unseen? If someone has such powers, wouldn't you consider this ilm al ghayb But the Holy Quran confirms that Prophet Isa salam, did have this ilm al ghayb And therefore, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt also did have ilm al ghayb This is not an act of idolization to believe that they had ilm al ghayb because the Holy Quran demonstrates that certain individuals are given permission by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have ilm al ghayb At the end of Surah Al-Jinn, what do we say? There is a verse in the Holy Quran that, stands, that states, Alim al ghayb Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has ilm al ghayb Alim al ghayb fala yudhiru ala ghaybihi ahada. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not share his ilm al ghayb with anyone except. There's an exception in the Holy Quran. Whenever there's an exception, pay attention to that exception. Accept those people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been pleased with and he has considered them to be his representatives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does give them ilm al ghayb And it is through this knowledge that they can perform some of these miracles. You are all familiar with Asif ibn Barkhiyah. He was the representative or the successor of Prophet Sulaiman, peace be upon him. The one who had some knowledge of the book, he was able to summon the throne of Sheba from Yemen all the way to Palestine within an instant, within a blink of an eye, because he had some knowledge of the book. This is not an act of idolization. The Holy Quran confirms this reality. And hence, Imam al Hussein salam, in a beautiful narration, he says one day, Umar and Abu Bakr came 
to the presence of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. They told him, Ya Rasulullah, can you explain to us the meaning of this verse? Wa kulla shay'in ahsaynahu fi imam mubeen. And we have contained everything in a book, in an imam, of course. The Holy Quran says imam, but many have translated this to mean a book, in a preserved book, in a clear book. Ya Rasulullah, tell us, what, what is this book? Is it the Torah, the Old Testament? The Prophet, peace be upon him, told them, no, it's not. They asked him, Ya Rasulullah, what is this? Is it the Injil, the New Testament? The Prophet says, no. They said, okay, it must be the Holy Quran. Is it the Holy Quran? The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, no. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved the knowledge in the Holy Quran. But the Quran, when it says, Imam in Mubin, it's referring to something else. So they tell him, Ya Rasulullah, we give up. Tell us, what is the Quran referring to? Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he says, at that point I saw my father Ali ibn Abi Talib coming. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, pointed towards Ali ibn Abi Talib and he says, this is the man who is the Imam al Bubin, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gathered the entire knowledge. Therefore, it is very evident that based on the principles of the Holy Qur'an, to believe that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt did have such powers is not an act of idolization. Now this takes us to a very important position that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt occupy. And this is highly debated amongst the ulama. Let us examine this briefly in order for us to know our leaders and the great position that they occupy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the debated positions of the Imams, peace be upon them, is that are they intermediaries of God when it comes to this creation? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create this universe through them or no? You have two viewpoints over here. The first viewpoint says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delegated the entire tasks of the universe to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Now, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt were very clear when it came to this view. You know, they tell you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the Imams and then He simply delegated the entire universe to them. They are the ones who run the universe. And this is similar to what the Jews said about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, they said God created the universe in six stages or six days. And then on the seventh day, He was kind of tired, so He had to rest. And that's how the Sabbath originated. Because God on the seventh day, or was a Saturday, he had to rest. And ever since, you know, God is not really doing much because he created everything and he decreed everything till, you know, the eternity of time. This view is very similar to what the Jews said about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once Al Imam al Radha alayhi salam was asked about tafweev in Arabic, this belief that God delegated the task of running the universe is called tafweed in Arabic. He was asked by one of his companions about tafweed. Tell me about tafweed. Is it true or not? The Imam salam says we have two types of delegation. We have the religious delegation, which yes, I accept. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delegated the task of spreading his religion to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. And the source to that, the proof to that is the Holy Quran. Because the Holy Quran says, وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ مَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whatever the Prophet brings forth for you, accept it. And whatever he does not, then reject it. Whatever the Prophet prohibits you from, then do not do it. Abstain from it. Refrain from it. This is a type of delegation which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. As for the Imams of Ahlul Bayt creating the universe and sustaining the universe, giving the rizq to the creation of God and to people, Al Imam Al Radha salam, in this hadith he rejects it. He said no. Because the Quran is very clear that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who creates. It is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the one who sustains. So which, correct, which view is the correct one here? The Imams of Ahlul Bayt therefore demonstrated that this second one, this first view is not a correct view. The second view is one that we receive from a letter by Imam Al Mahdi Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. During the minor occultation, Al Ghaybatul Sughra, 
the followers of Ahlul Bayt disputed amongst themselves. Do the Imams of Ahlul Bayt create and sustain the universe or do they not? Some said that's impossible. How can they do that? Others said, no, it's possible. If God gives them the permission, they can do something like that. So they said, why don't we go to the second na'ib of the imam, the second deputy or ambassador of the imam, the al-amri who was the second one. Let's go to him and let him solve this for us because he has access to al-imam al-mahdi. So let's go to him. They go to him, they ask him the question. He forwards the question to al-imam al-mahdi faraja. The imam writes back the answer in a letter. He says, it is He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who creates, and it is He who divides the rizq, the sustenance. As for us, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers our prayers, so He creates. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God answers our prayers, and He gives the sustenance. The Imam salam gives the position very clear in this letter. He says, we only ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do not directly create. Yes, through us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates. And hence, the imams of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, act as intermediaries between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Through them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the universe. God is the one who created, but through them and because of them and for their sake. In the first ziyarah of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, you will find it in Mafatih al Jinan. In the first ziyarah, which is the most authentic ziyarah, there's a phrase in which the Imam alayhi salam teaches us to say, Bikum fatahallah wa bikum yakhtim wa bikum tumbitul ardu ashjaraha. It is through you, O Ahlul Bayt, that every tree grows on the face of the planet. It is through you, O Ahlul Bayt, that every tree gives fruits, and it is through you, O Ahlul Bayt, that the clouds of the sky pour the rain on the people and give them their rizq and sustenance. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Now you may, want, you may be wondering, isn't this an act of idolization? How can we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Ahlul Bayt created the universe and because of them He sustains us? The Holy Quran again is our source. To demonstrate this reality, when it comes to, for example, many tasks, like the taking of the soul, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us in the Holy Quran? We have three verses that address the taking, the act of taking our soul. One verse states, Allahu yatawaffal anfus hina mawtaha. It is He, God, the Almighty, the one who takes our souls at the moment of death. Yet you have a second verse in the Holy Quran which tells you, Qul yatawaffakum malakul mawta alladhi wukla bikum. O Prophet, tell your people that it is the angel of death who takes your soul. Yet another third verse states, it is the angels of God who take our souls. Now, is there a contradiction here? Is there a discrepancy here? So who is it at the end of the day? Does God take our soul or the angel of death or other angels? There is no contradiction here because the Quran is demonstrating to us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate authority. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has intermediaries. He has means through which he runs the universe. And one of them is the angel of death. God does not need the angel of death. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a wise purpose has assigned him for this task. And so on and so forth with the other angels of God. The Holy Quran is filled with verses that speak about the angels who are responsible for the winds, for the oceans, for the mountains, for everything that goes on in the universe. Now I tell you, the human being is greater or the angels of God. If the angels of God are intermediaries between the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do you not think that the best of God's creation who come from the human beings also occupy that position to a greater extent? Just look at the story of Prophet Adam alayhi salam. Who is the one who prostrated to who? Did Allah instruct him to prostrate to the angels or did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instruct the angels to prostrate to Prophet Adam alayhi salam? Adam alayhi salam had that knowledge. وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا Because of that knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed the angels to prostrate to Prophet Adam alayhi salam. Now I tell you, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, in one beautiful hadith, 
he tells us Adam had 25 portions out of the 72 portions of knowledge that Allah has ever created for his creation. If the angels are prostrating to a creation who has 25 portions of the knowledge, then imagine when the Imam السلام, tells us that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, had 72 out of 73 portions of knowledge. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. Brothers and sisters, we can never reach and grasp the level of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. And Imam al Sadiq السلام, he says, Speak about our virtues all you want. Yes, don't make us God. Don't ascribe any divine attributes to us, but speak about our qualities till the day of judgment. You shall never ever come close to grasping our reality. This is the position that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. One day, an Imam al Sadiq was telling one of his companions, he told them, Listen, you think you can know the status of us, Ahlul Bayt? You don't even know the great status God gives to an average believer. The Imam gives him an example. He says, when two believers get together, they embrace one another, they shake hands, their sins fall, just as the trees of a leaf, just as the leaves of a tree fall on a windy, cold day. This is just one small glimpse of the amazing status Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a believer. You think you can reach the status of us al bayt You think you can ever grasp that when God has given such a huge position? To the believer? Absolutely not. No one can reach the status of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. Especially Al Imam Abi Abdullah Al Hussein. Because he sacrificed everything in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded him in such an amazing way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him everything because he gave everything in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, finally, how does this issue of idolization apply to our lives, respected brothers and sisters? You see that unfortunately in many societies, there is a tendency to elevate certain individuals and idolize them. And this creates so many problems in our society, in our everyday lives. Now this is reflected in several ways. In four ways we can see how this issue of idolization applies to our everyday life. This is a practical dimension to the issue of idolization. One way in which this is reflected is that you find throughout history, there have been people who have been elevated more than their position. People have exceeded their position by idolizing them. For example, you have people like Khalid ibn al-Walid. This man, do you know what he did after the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him? He was the one who attacked Malik ibn Nuwayra, this great companion of Rasulullah. And he is the one who beheaded him and he raped his wife. Look at the history. Look at the history of all Muslims. They've mentioned this. And yet, till this very day, you find many Muslims, when they refer to Khalid ibn Walid, what do they say? They say, Sayfullah al Maslul. You know, this unsheathed sword of God. He is the sword of God. And they glorify him. This is an act of idolization. Unfortunately, throughout history, we see this, brothers and sisters. Even in our Western societies, to give you an example, Christopher Columbus. There is no doubt that he was a great expeditionist. There is no doubt about that. And he made many achievements and contributions. But if you examine a book, for example, which is the history of the people of the United States, authored by the historian Howard Zinn, he gives you another side of Christopher Columbus. He tells you this man was a mass murderer. Do you know how many people this person killed? The most conservative estimates tell us that Christopher Columbus killed over one million people. More estimates, more accurate estimates tell us that three million people, only in Haiti, he was responsible for the death and killing of 500,000 people. And yet, you see, today he's considered, you know, a major hero, especially in the United States. You have an entire city named after him, Columbus, Ohio. You know, interestingly, ironically, the residents of Columbus, Ohio are 800,000 people. You know, Christopher Columbus killed more people than the residents of the city after which he was named. Isn't that an irony? Isn't that a paradox? This is one type of idolization that we see. Another way in which we see idolization reflected in our societies is unfortunately when we see our youth 
idolizing actors and singers and those who distract them from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This has negative consequences on our society. You see that they idolize their standards, they idolize their styles, anything that they do now penetrates our youth and our societies. I remember once I was seeing this television interview, this person was asking two girls, two teenage girls, about a very well-known singer. So this person was asking them, you know, just a theoretical question. He asked one of those girls, what do you think if this singer, this, you know, famous person, if he were to park in a place which is illegal, do you think he should be ticketed or no? Do you think his car should be towed or not? You know what she said? You know, in Arabic they say, The one who transmits the kufr is not a kafir. You know what this person said? And of course she said this in a very bad way, but this reflects the mentality of many of the youth. She said, of course, he's God. He can do whatever he wants. This was publicized. You know, this was aired on television. And unfortunately, many of the youth, they do idolize these figures. Or sometimes it could be politicians. And this has so many negative consequences. Now, another very important way in which this is reflected in our society is respected brothers and sisters. This issue of idolization is reflected through our families. There is no doubt that we should love our families. You love your wife as much as you can. You love your husband. You love your children. But unfortunately, what we see in many communities that we see these family members sometimes become idolized. Let me give you an example. Whenever, and I say this with full confidence, whenever you choose your wife over your mother, your spouse over your father, this is an act of idolization. Because now you have exceeded your limits. Once I visited a community, and this mother, she was in so much pain, she was crying. She says, Sayyid, I want to share with you something. Help me, please. Her, her husband either passed away or she, was, or she was divorced. She says, I have no place to live except in the house of my son. Now my daughter-in-law, the wife of my son, is against me. She does not like me. I do not have a room in the house of my son. They have locked me in one corner. And I cannot move except with their permission. Even when I go to the kitchen, I need his wife's permission. Even when I want to eat, they have to give me permission. Even if I want to eat, I have to use my own plates, my own spoons, my own forks. I cannot touch her spoons and forks. And my son is doing nothing. He's giving her the freedom to do that. Brothers and sisters, this is an act of idolization. A, few, a couple of years ago, it was Christmas Eve, I was watching CNN. They were, doing, they were conducting this interview with a soldier who was based in Afghanistan. And he was extremely you know, sorrow. He said on Christmas Eve, and he started to cry. He was emotional. He says, I'm away from my wife and from my children. And he began to cry on TV. Now, something that puzzled me, I thought to myself, okay, he's young. He looked like he was in his 20s. Obviously, you know, his parents were most likely alive. He made no mention of his parents. Subhanallah, on Christmas Eve, he cried. He shed tears for his wife, for his children, which is good. Love your family. Love your children. But he did not mention a single thing about his parents. He did not even bother to say salam to his parents, to greet his parents on Christmas Eve. And unfortunately, you see this type of idolization in Western society. When you become 18 and you move out, you lose your parents 50%. And the day that you get married, you lose them 100%. This is an act of idolization. That is not acceptable, respected brothers and sisters. And finally, the fourth way in which this act of idolization exceeding the limits that we see in our society has to do with premarital love. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying the religion of Islam is against love. Love as much as you can. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, tells us about the importance and the benefits of love. But you should know whom to love and in what conditions. The problem is that when it comes to premarital love, brothers and sisters, we are blinded. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, what does he say? He says, He says, the blind of the one who has fallen in love, the eyes of the one who has fallen in love, they are blinded to the faults of that person whom they love. And you know what often happens? I tell you from the experience of thousands of our youth. 
What happens when you fall in love with someone without doing the proper research to see if this person has the appropriate qualities? A year, two, maximum three years later, you come, you turn, you transform from loving this person the most on earth to hating this person the most on earth. This is happening every day in our societies. And why does that happen? Because it's a reaction. When you realize that you've been fooled, you've loved this person for three years, and you were willing to do anything for that person, to sacrifice for that person, then when you come to discover the dark side of this person, you have this negative reaction, and you start to hate this person because you feel betrayed. So the religion of Islam says, love all you can, that's fine. But do the proper research, find the important qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for you, then fall in love. That way, you have created a safety valve for yourself. In conclusion, brothers and sisters, giving preference to anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an act of idolization. And this is what we learned from Al-Imam Abi Abdullah al Hussein salawatullahi alayhi on these holy nights. Al-Imam al Hussein alayhi salam in beautiful lines of poetry, he says, Ilahi taraktu al-khalqa turran fi hawaka. Oh Allah, I have abandoned the creation. I've abandoned life, my home, my comfortable house, my family. For what? For which purpose? وَأَيْتَمْتُ الْعِيَالَ لِكَيْ أَرَاكَ O oh Allah, I have orphaned my children. For what purpose? To meet you, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam teaches you, give preference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't let anything in life take precedence before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Give the priority to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَلَوْ قَطَّعْتَنِي فِي الْحُبِّ إِرْبَانِ لَمَا مَالَ الْفُؤَادِ إِلَىٰ سِوَاكَ Therefore, O oh Allah, if you cut me into pieces for your love, my heart shall not swerve an iota, O oh Allah. لَمَا مَالَ الْفُؤَادُ إِلَىٰ سِوَاكَ Now, one of those little children that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam had to farewell in Medina was Fatima. She was ill. The Imam السلام, he gathers his family. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, Qamar Bani Hashim, the moon of Bani Hashim, come, we have to leave Medina. Get the caravan ready. They depart, but they leave Fatima al-Sughra with Umm Salama, the wife of the Holy Prophet. Fatima, she's crawling towards Abi Abdullah al Hussein. She says, my father, how can you leave me behind? I want to come with you. The Imam tells her, oh Fatima, it's okay. If we go to Iraq and we settle there, I shall send Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas to come and pick you up. You're ill now, you cannot join us. She says, oh Father Hussein, how can I bear? Being separated from you, oh Father, please don't do that to me. At least keep Abdullah al Radi' with me so that I find consolation, comfort in him. The Imam tells her, Oh, my dear Fatima, I cannot do that. Don't you see? He's young, he's only six months old, he's nursed by his mother, he needs his mother. Uh, the Imam alayhi salam departs, she begins to cry, Al-Wada, Al-Wada, Al-Firaq, Al-Firaq. This is our final farewell. Every day this little Fatima, she would go to the room of Imam al Hussein to see if there was any news from them. And then one day she sees a person, he is going out to Iraq, a traveler. She writes a letter to her father, Abi Abdullah al Hussein. This traveler takes this letter, he takes it to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. When does he arrive, Karbala? On the 10th day of Muharram, when the companions of the family members of Imam al Hussein were massacred, he reaches Karbala, he delivers this letter to Imam al Hussein. The Imam alayhi salam, he opens this letter. Look at the sorrow of Abi Abdullah al Hussein during this final moment. He says his, his daughter has written him a letter, Oh dear father, did you send Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas to come and pick me up? What can Imam al Hussein think in those moments? When the body of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was lying next to the river, his arms amputated, his head was severed, and the spear was implanted in his eyes. The Imam takes the letter, he gives it to the woman, they all begin to cry. 
on the second day of Muharram, the caravan of Imam al Hussein السلام, reaches the land of Karbala. The Imam السلام, asks his companions, My dear companions, please tell me what is the name of this land? They tell him, Oh, Hussein, one of the names of this land is Al Ghadriyat. The Imam says, I want another name. Does it have another name? They said, Yes, name Noah. They mentioned several names, but Al Imam Al Hussein was looking for that name which he had heard from his grandfather, Rasulullah, until he was told, Oh, Hussein, the name of this land is Karbala. This is Karbala. The Imam Ali Salam, his eyes were filled with tears when he heard that this is the land of Karbala. Zainab Alayhi Salam, even before hearing the word Karbala, when they reached that land, she said, My brother Hussein, I feel this sorrow, this depression in my heart. Oh, Abba Abdullah, I can't explain it. As soon as we got to this land, I saw the sorrow occupying my heart. Al Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam tells her, Oh, Zainab, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Then the Imam addressed his companions. He told them, Oh, my companions, ha huna mahattu rihalina. My companions, this is Karbala. Trials and tribulations, this is where we shall settle. This is where we shall camp. Ashabi hana tuqtalu rijaluna. My dear companions, this is where our men shall be slaughtered. Ha huna tuzbahu atfaluna. This is where our children shall be massacred and killed. My dear companions, ha huna tuzbahu. This is where our women shall be taken as prisoners of war. Imagine the companions of the Imam, the women and children, they all begin to cry when they hear this. And then Imam al Hussein, according to one narration, he steps down from his horse. He takes Lady Zainab with him. Oh, Zainab, come, I'll show you. Zainab, you see this place? This is where Ali and Al Akbar shall be killed. Oh Zainab, you see this area, this is where Qasim shall fall and he shall be killed. Aywa Imama. Then the Imam alayhi salam takes Zainab to the Euphrates River. Zainab is puzzled. Why did he take me so far? What's going on here? The Imam tells her, Oh Zainab, this is where Abel Fadl al Abbas shall be struck and this is where he shall be fallen. And then, all oh, believers, here comes the tragedy when the Imam alayhi salam takes Lady Zainab to a low lying area next to the hill of Zainabi at Tel Zainabi. Oh, Zainab, this is where I shall fall from my horse. And oh, Zainab, this is where the enemies shall behead me. Assalamu ala al Hussein. وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين ورحمة الله وبركاته. Raise your hands in dua, brothers and sisters. With a broken heart, with tears, Allah subhanahu wa taala has guaranteed that He will answer our prayers. Raise your hand five times. I want everyone, brothers and sisters. Allah has promised to answer your prayers. Everyone with me. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أمن أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء. Raise your hands. يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله. Oh Allah, hasten the reappearance of our Master Al Imam Al Mahdi. Oh Allah, make us amongst His sincere companions. O oh Allah, grant us the shafa'ah of Abi Abdullah al-Hussein. 
Oh Allah, grant us the ziyara of Abiy Abdullah al Hussein. Wa ila arwah al Mu'minin wal Mu'minat. Nuhdi thawab surat al Fatiha. Tasbiq wa salatu ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. بسم الله सजदे में जिसने अपना सजदे में जिसने अपना सर भी कटा दिया उसको भुला दिया तुम कैसे कल मगो इस लाइला पे जिसने घर को लुटा दिया उसको भुला दिया तुम कैसे कल मगो इस लाइला पे जिसने घर को लुटा दिया उसको भुला दिया तुम कैसे कल मगो सजदे में जिसने अपना सजदे में जिसने अपना सर भी कटा दिया उसको भुला दिया तुम कैसे कल मगो इस लाइला पे जिसने घर को लुटा दिया उसको बुला दिया 
تم کیسے کلمہ گو اس لائلہ پہ جس نے گھر کو لٹا دیا اس کو بلا دیا تم کیسے کل مگو تم اپنی غیرتوں کو بازار میں تو لاؤ روئیں گے ہم کبھی نہ اپنا میار غیرت دنیا کو تم دکھاؤ روئیں گے ہم کبھی نہ غیرت تیری کو جس نے غیرت تیری کو جس نے شرم و حیاء دیا اس کو بلا دیا تم کیسے کل مگو اس لائلہ پہ جس نے گھر کو لٹا دیا اس کو بولا دیا تم کیسے کل مگو اس لائلہ پہ جس نے گھر کو لٹا دیا اس کو بھولا دیا تم کیسے کل مگو انسانیت کی جس دم سانسیں اٹک رہی تھی کس نے دیا سہارا دنیا میں جب شریعت در در بھٹک رہی تھی کس نے دیا سہارا وہ حق پرست جس نے وہ حق پرست جس نے حق سے ملا دیا اس کو بھولا دیا تم کیسے کل مگو اس لائلہ پہ جس نے گھر کو لٹا دیا اس کو بھولا دیا تم کیسے کل مگو اس لائلہ پہ جس نے گھر کو لٹا دیا اس کو بھولا دیا تم کیسے کل مگو یہ کربلا نہ ہوتی آزان بھی نہ ہوتی تم کل مگو نہ ہوتے دنیا میں لائلا کی پہچان بھی نہ ہوتی تم کل مگو نہ ہوتے توحفے میں جس نے تم کو توحفے میں جس نے تم کو یہ لائلا دیا اس کو بھولا دیا تم کیسے کل مگو اس لائلہ پہ جس نے گھر کو لٹا دیا اس کو بھولا دیا تم کیسے کل مگو اس لائلہ پہ جس نے گھر کو لٹا دیا اس کو بھولا دیا تم کیسے کل مگو انسان آج ہوتے انسانیت نہ ہوتی ہوتی عزیدیت گر سب بت پرست ہوتے بہدانیت نہ ہوتی ہوتی عزیدیت گر جس نے یزیدیت کا جس نے یزیدیت کا نقشہ مٹا دیا اس کو بھولا دیا تم کیسے کل مگو اس لائلہ پہ جس نے گھر کو لٹا دیا اس کو بولا دیا 
تم کیسے کلمہ گو اس لا الہ پہ جس نے گھر کو لٹا دیا اس کو بولا دیا تم کیسے کلمہ گو اے مترز بتائے کعبے پہ سنگ باری یہ کیسا دین ہے آل نبی کے دشمن اسلام سے آیاری یہ کیسا دین ہے باطل کے رخ سے پردہ باطل کے رخ سے پردہ جس نے ہٹا دیا اس کو بھلا دیا تم کیسے کلمہ گو اس لا الہ پہ جس نے گھر کو لٹا دیا اس کو بھلا دیا تم کیسے کلمہ گو اس لا الہ پہ جس نے گھر کو لٹا دیا اس کو بھولا دیا تم کیسے کلمہ گو سجدے میں جس نے اپنا سجدے میں جس نے اپنا سر بھی کٹا دیا اس کو بھولا دیا